2018. Um, I think Lauren did this last year, so hopefully we'll focus mostly on what's happened in the last 12 months, although we'll go a little bit deeper than that. Um, these slides will be made available because there's quite a few links in them, so don't panic if there's something you wanted to um, look up afterwards. You'll get all the information. And here's the agenda for today. So I'm going to give a short overview of what's happened in the Office of Scholarly Communication in 2017, uh, and then what kind of projects we're working on as well. And then we'll talk about what's happening with Hefke, uh, and we'll look a little bit at funders and what they're doing with open access, their open access policies. And finally, we'll look at about news, what's going on in other countries with open access as well as publishers. I hate to say it, it's mainly Elsevier, but hopefully it will be interesting. Okay, and if you have any questions, um, I have Claire here, who's moderating. Woohoo, she's waving. Um, and so you can chat in the box to the right, and she'll help make sure I've noticed them as well, and hopefully answer your questions. So let's get started. Well, so in 2017, OSC has unveiled a new look for itself, fancy new logo with lots of colors. Um, and each color actually does mean something. So we have the usual standard orange for open access, um, blue for research data management, uh, green for thesis management, in which we'll talk a little bit about the, new, the department and what people are expecting of thesis now. And then we have gray, which is our advocacy and communication, which is, I think, basically Claire. Um, not saying she's gray, but there you go. And as part of our advocacy and communication, uh, we provide a lot of training, not just to librarians, but to researchers as well as PhDs. Uh, for example, we offer an introduction to open access, and we try to argue the important points of making people's work open access, such as uh, what we mean, sorry, what we mean by open access is making scholarly research outputs freely available to access online for everyone. Research relies on the principle that we share our findings so that others can build on the work that comes before. And human knowledge is furthered by sharing ideas, not hiding them behind a paywall, which is what happens to most of the articles that get published. So you all, may all be familiar with the graphic here that was created by Danny Kingsley and Sarah Brown, which shows the benefits of open access to the wider community. Uh, for example, researchers in developing countries will be able to access articles that perhaps their universities can't afford the subscriptions to. Um, more selfishly, the researchers can benefit from higher citation rates as well as more exposure for their work. So we talk, uh, and there's also one about compliance with grant rules, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So I thought I would start off by sharing some OSC stats with you from 2017. We've actually been quite busy. Um, we continue to meet with different departments around the university to um, ensure and encourage people to deposit their papers and comply with the REF open access policy. So as we mentioned in last year's update, Synthetic Element, which is the university's internal reporting software, was rolled out and it's been quite successful. As you can see, in 2016, we had 5,452 deposits, and in 2017, we had 7,627. Now these deposits include journal art articles, conference proceedings, but also data sets and book chapters. Uh, we can't use everything that is deposited. Sometimes uh, researchers deposit the wrong things, but word has gotten out and people are depositing, which is evident from our next slide. So in January to 20, uh, April 2018, we've already hit 4,051. I think uh, the word about REF open access policy has got out and people are more enthusiastic to deposit their papers, we hope. Uh, if However, not everything that is deposited in Apollo is immediately available to the public. So we do have a request to copy feature where a member of the public or another researcher can click on the item and a form will appear where they can request a copy of the paper from the author. And last year we had 3,108 requests that we had to facil facilitate um, and 1,282 of those were for thesis, which I'll come back to in a little bit. Now. Open access doesn't just refer to journal articles, but also applies to data sets. Many funders now require that the underpinning data of a research article be made available as well. 
And here's a similar graphic to the one we had earlier. This one was made by our own Rosie Higman, who's now currently left the OSD and is at the University of Manchester, which we're very sad about, but good luck to her. There are a lot of overlaps with the open access graphs, such as increased citation rates and exposure, more exposure for work. But we also highlight that making data open improves efficiency and reproducibility, and it can also lead to more collaborations. And in fact, the RDM team met a great milestone, an important milestone last year, by depositing their 1,000th 1, data set in Apollo. Uh, we celebrated with a garden party that wasn't to be due to some lovely incremental weather, but it was a, a good achievement for them as well. Which also brings home to the fact that we have evidence that depositing your data does increase exposure and visibility of your work. So this is um, from IRUS which is, let me make sure I get this right, Institutional Repository Usage Statistics for UK, mouthful, which uh, consolidate statistics stated that in 2017, out of 132 higher education institutions in the UK, 36% of all the data downloads that occurred came from our very own Institutional Repository, Apollo. So that does prove that Apollo is being found. It's all indexed by Google, and people are finding the data and downloading it. Some evidence to back you up. So that's what's been going on with Open Access Team and the Research Data Management Team. And now we are going to move to the thesis management, which we are also um, organizing. So around the Board of Graduate Studies decided that along with the hardbound copy of their thesis, students must also now deposit an e-version as of 1st of October 2017. So this will be uploaded into Apollo and be made available. So anyone depositing their thesis after 1st of October 2017 was supposed to adhere, adhere to this new rule. Um, after some feedback, possibly fairly loud feedback, uh, the Board of Graduate Studies amended this decision to allow students depositing their thesis to opt in for open access or to choose a managed access. So on our website, we have this lovely um, chart that tells you the different levels of access that students can um, apply for. Uh, this all applies to students that are depositing before the 30th of September 2018. There is supposed to be a new policy in place for the 1st of October 2018 for students submitting afterwards. So you can see this is an evolving situation here. Um, a lot of the feedback that students gave us was over third-party copyright material. So these were a lot of third-year students who were all of a sudden told that they had to deposit electronically and hadn't sought permission for a lot of the material that was in their thesis. So we had to redact. Um, we are able to redact, but some thesis that would have not been a possibility. Um, so the OSC team led by Zoe walker Fag, have been working hard to alleviate students' fears and have helped put these provisions in place. So hopefully next year we'll have a new update for you on what is going on with thesis management. Okay. So now the different projects. OSC has been doing a lot of projects um, throughout the year. The first one being the Open Research Survey. Um, so we had a review in the OSC last year in 2017. And one of the outcomes of this review was the recommendation that the university develop a position statement on open research. So there, a working group was created and it includes representatives from each school, central services, and the postdoctoral community. And the working group has put together a survey that was sent out to researchers already to better understand their feelings towards open research at Cambridge. Now we're all hoping for some positive feedback, but there might be some negative feedback. And all of this is supposed to inform the university's position and statement on open research. And open research includes not just open access for journals and data and articles, but also data, software, code, etc. So it's supposed to encompass all of it. That's one project that we're working on. Um, another one is the text and data mining test kitchen. So Danny Kingsley and Debbie Hansen have been working with Cambridge Digital Humanities and Cambridge University Press on a text and data mining pilot test. So just for a little bit, a brief overview, um, TDM, or text and data mining, allows researchers to go through large amounts of data, and we mean large amounts of data, 
electronically to look for patterns. To try and do this manually would take years or else be totally impossible without the aid of technology. If you do want to learn more, um, we'll provide a link. James Caldwell made a fantastic uh, LibGuide that's available on the LibGuide page about text and data mining. So the pilot project is aimed at researchers who are interested in using this technique. Um, and the researchers will be offered advice on issues around intellectual rights, data access, corpus creation, which I'm not really all that clear on. Um, and they will be granted access to high performance computing facilities and data visualization methods. The aim of the pilot is to create a number of case studies to prove the potential of TDM, but also identify any obstacles. One such obstacle that has already been very early on identified is uh, being able to access the material from publishers. Most of our contracts allow for TDM. However, the logistics of accessing this much data without shutting down the database for the entire university has proved a challenge. It's something they're still working on. And we all know how annoying it is when a database gets shut down. Uh, and finally, we also have the Journal Coronation Scheme Project. So this was mentioned by Patricia Killard at the recent Cambridge University Libraries Conference. It's to do with we are having, you know, everyone knows that the publishers keep increasing subscription costs to journals and at an alarming rate. So the university would like to gain a better understanding of how researchers interact with these journals. And then the project is taking sort of a two-pronged approach. We're going to look at quantitative data and we're doing a qualitative aspect as well. For the quantitative side, we are trying to gather as much data as possible on how articles are downloaded or cited at Cambridge. We also want to know how many Cambridge authors are peer reviewing articles as well as editing them. Uh, doing all of this for free, of course. So for the qualitative side, we are selecting researchers who tend to use smaller journals that aren't part of these big uh, publisher bundles. They're called long tail journals. And we are pulling them aside for a quick interview um, to see how they interact with the journals as well. And we, what we're, we're trying to gather is not just we're trying to understand what would happen if we were to opt out of one of these big deals with publishers. Um, and we're also trying to create a methodology that can be used from year to year to track these statistics. So it's something that's not just a moment in time view, but something that can be used for the future as well. And it will provide evidence while we're negotiating with our publishers. Okay. So next. Um, this isn't so much the OSC, but the Research Information Office has unveiled a new citation database that we are um, using. It's called Dimensions. This was created by the Digital Science, the same people who brought you altmetrics.com and Symplectic Elements. Dimensions is similar to Scopus and Web of Science in that it tracks citations and publications. However, it also includes um, grants, patents, and clinical trials. It, aims to have, it also claims to have more articles than the other competitors. I'm going to read you the slide. It is an interesting tool to explore, especially if you want to track funding by researchers and what kind of publications were produced from those fundings, and it can really help um, increase collaborations as well. So it's, and it's quite a nice user face as well. Uh, they've been providing some training on it, and I enjoyed using it. So that ends the overview of the OSC. And now we're going to look at what's happening to Hefty. So, HEFTI is, as I'm sure we're all aware, is the Higher Education Funding Council of England, and it runs the Research Excellent Framework, the REF, which impacts how much money research universities receive. And for some departments, this is where the majority of their funding comes from, so it is very important, and historically, Cambridge has always done very well. In fact, every researcher who meets certain criteria is required to submit at least one research output to be evaluated by the REF panel. This happens about every five years. The next one is 2021. So in order for the research output to be eligible for the next REF, the authors must meet REF's open access requirements, which state that a journal or conference article with an ISSN number must be deposited in an open access repository within three months of acceptance and be open to the public within 12 months of publication for STEM and within 24 months for COSS, Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences. So what's one of the bigger changes that ha has happened? Well, as of 31st of March 2018, HEFTI has ceased to exist. Um, there was a law 
a research law, no, sorry, the Higher Education and Research Act was passed in 2017, which brought to end HEPD and has replaced it with quite a few other things, one of which is the Office for Students. And this is the new regulator for higher education in England. They are to protect students' interests and oversee the next TEF. There's lots of REF and TEF, and there's a KEF as well. Don't ask me what that is. Um, secondly, another body was created called Research England. This is another council, and this is the council that will be coordinating the REF. I hope you're all still with me. So Research England will now sit under UCRE, or UK Research and Innovation. And on their website, they say they are the agency for research and innovation. Very innovative. Um, they will oversee the seven research councils, all listed there. And they also will oversee Innovate UK and Research England. Main, I guess, takeaway from this is that hefty website links are um, not being transitioned very quickly. So you may be faced with a lot of broken links for the next six months because they're not being directed properly. And we will try to keep them updated as best we can. But this is, we will stop using the phrase hefty now and we'll have to use, start using UCRI and Research England and it's all very confusing. Um, so further to these changes, as of 1st of April 2018, the REF rules have changed. Uh, so REF 2021 covers papers that are published between the 1st of January 2014 to the 31st of December 2020. And this is, it might sound, you might all be rolling your eyes, but actually quite a few researchers don't know these dates. Um, so it's important to note, any papers published between January 2014 through the 31st of March 2016 are automatically eligible for REF. So they don't need to meet any requirements. Any articles published after the 1st of April 2016 must be deposited within an open access repository. However, uh, it was usually within three months of acceptance, but for these two years, REF was allowed some leniency for researchers and they accepted po uh, papers that were deposited with three months of publication, which for um, departments or faculties like uh, humanities and social sciences, this is a big deal because usually there's a long delay between publication and acceptance. This has now ended and as of the 1st of April 2016, uh, sorry, 2018, excuse me, all papers must be deposited within three months of acceptance. If you do have a race to that has come running up to you um, saying, I forgot to deposit, what am I going to do? Please have them deposit anyway, because there are quite a few exceptions that we can apply and we can see how we can try and make it work. Sorry, I should have put that up. So three months of acceptance is the main rule. Further to this, so I've mentioned quite a few times a suitable open access repository and what that means. It's a very good question. Um, Apollo, for instance, is a suitable open access repository that is accepted by REF. Part of the requirement to be one is that you must, they must record an acceptance date, you must record what kind of version is deposited of the paper, and it has to be made available immediately after the publisher's embargo ends. So I'm sure all of you have heard of our archive and know it well. It's been around since 1991, and it's a large database of preprint um, resources. It is not considered a suitable open access repository, which causes a lot of confusion for uh, researchers. The reason why is because it doesn't maintain version control and it doesn't record the acceptance date. However, our very own Dan, uh, Danny Kingsley, along with Katie, Sha uh, I'm going to butcher this name, Shamish from um, GIF, have written a paper uh, arguing that REF should accept Archive as a suitable repository. And in fact, GISC has done some work to prove um, that most of the papers in there meet the compliance requirements. So if you have a spare time and you want to read 21 pages, you can read the ar argument for why it should be um, accepted by REF. I thought also now the last year some, some of the feedback we had, people were confused, little, oh, wanting to know how we encourage researchers to um, deposit in the archive uh, in Apollo. Uh, and right now there is a lot of REF teams working on this with us. So I thought it'd be a good idea to show you sort of the organizational chart of REF at Cambridge. So right now it's quite quick. This is a quick, you know, quick and dirty. 
Everything falls under the Pro Vice Chancellor for Research. And underneath him, we have an acting ref manager, Peter Hedges. It then sort of starts to split up the Research Strategy Office, which underneath that is Research Information Office, or RIO. And RIO is the one that maintains symplectic elements. So if you have any questions about symplectic elements, they're the ones to go to. On the other side, under Peter Hedges, there are two deputy ref managers, uh, Jurgen Wassel, who um, manages Rio, and Catherine Hurley. And under them, they then have ref teams, which it gets far more complicated, and I thought I didn't really quite understand it, so I thought I would leave it there. But just so you know, there are other people working on um, encouraging researchers to deposit their papers. Making ref eligible can be somewhat di sometimes difficult making papers sorry ref eligible can be difficult due to embargoes that publishers impose on research outputs so although this isn't necessarily new to 2017 or the last 12 months it may be important for researchers and for you talking to researchers who are looking to publish and still be in compliance with their funders and ref as you know i'm sure we can only um, process article processing charges that are funded by RCUK or by COAF, which is the Charities Open Access Fund, which Wellcome Trust is one of those. So let's say, for instance, some uh, researcher is faced now with covering their own article processing charges. We do have membership deals with publishers such as ACS, uh, American Chemical Society, MDPI, Royal Society, and Pindali that if they become members, you get a discount, usually up to 15%, which can add up quite a lot. We also have negotiated discounts with Wiley, Oxford Uni University Press, and Biomed Central on article processing charges. Sometimes they need to go through a prepayment dashboard, but um, they can be quite significant uh, reductions in price. The best deal we have so far, and the one you may want to share with your uh, your students and researchers is the Springer. It's called Springer Compact Deal. Now, for a certain set of journal articles, uh, journals, sorry, and there are quite a few of them, they have a, a fairly decent list. Any article written by a Cambridge researcher who is the corresponding author on the paper can have immediate open access at no extra charge. So it's free. But as I said, not every journal is included, but the deal is pretty good. So if a researcher, let's say, is funded by someone who doesn't uh, like let's say European Research Council and their grant is over and they can't pay for open access, they could try to publish through Springer and they would be um, in compliance with their funder requirement. Having said that, like we said, we cannot cover all research article processing charges and we can only cover the ones, as I mentioned before, from COAF, which is also, wel which is uh, Welcome Trust is included. So, Welcome Trust was one of the first funders to introduce their open access policy back in 2005. Um, and although they've mended over the years, they've never actually done a review of their policy. Thus far, they, have, they say that 75% of their researchers are in compliance with the open access policy, which is quite good. However, I should mention this, that Welcome is one of the only funders who also has a penalty for not meeting their requirements, and it's a significant penalty. It's about... Um, 10% of the total amount of their grant will be taken away if you don't meet their requirements. So a little bit of a stick there. They also have done some research and noted that the article processing charges for hybrid journals, which are those that are traditionally a subscription journal but offer an open access option, are 34% higher than those that are fully open access journals. And in fact, from 2015 to 2016, Welcome has paid out 5.7 million pounds through COAF on making, uh, paying for immediate open access of journal articles. 71% of that fund was to hybrid journals. So this is not really a self-sustaining, doesn't seem to like be a sustain, sustainable process. So part of their review, which is happening starting in May, they've decided that the open access environment has changed quite a lot with new funder-led publishing platforms such as Welcome Open Research, and the Gates Foundation has a Kronos, which I think was mentioned in the last update. Um, also, the cre increased use of preprint servers and work on the UK scholarly communications license. This has all led them to doing a review, and they aim to ensure that there is continued openness of research. They want to support the transition to fully open access world. They have a policy that is clear as possible, sometimes welcome is not that clear, so that it increases compliance or at least makes it easier to comply. 
and ensure that costs are fair and proportionate. So how will this review be done? Well, they're doing an internal review by Welcome Trust members. They will also create a survey and of course pass it out because everyone creates a survey. Um, they're talking to institutions that handle block grants, much like Cambridge does, so we're included in that, as well as other COAF partners such as Arthritis UK, like Cancer Research UK, and a couple others. They're also talking to publishers. And they're going to watch UCRI, the new HEPI, um, review of their open access policy. So that completes those, the first two sections of the OSC review and what's going on with publishers and HEPI. Now we're going to talk about, we're almost there at the end, and other news. Um, so this isn't quite new news, but Fran the French government has issued a new law that says that scientific research that's at least half funded by the government, local, departmental, public institutions, national funding agencies, or the European Union, and it's published in a certain kind of journal, it allows the author the right to make it freely open access even after having allowed exclusive rights to a publisher. This concerns accepted manuscripts only, not the published version. It can be made openly available after an embargo period of six months for STEM or 12 months for Haas. The work cannot be used for commercial purposes and the author has no obligation to make the work open access, they are simply allowed to do so. This is great, especially for us if all the authors agree to make it open access because if they don't have money to fund an article processing charge but they still want to adhere to the compliance rules, the French government is saying they've passed a law that they can do so. Um, moving next door to them, Germany. So Germany versus Elsevier. Germany, uh, Germany's contract with Elsevier, I think it's usually they're around five years, was coming up for negotiation. Um, and they have a nationwide negotiating coalition called Project Deal. And they decided to take quite a hard line against Elsevier because Elsevier was trying to, of course, increase the cost of the subscription. So negotiations, negotiations excuse me, have been going on for over a year. They mainly, the main sticking points are pricing, open access, and how costs should be calculated. I believe Germany would, is arguing to pay for articles that are published by their own authors, whereas Elsevier is saying that's not fair because you'll have access to anything written by anyone over the world, around the world. So what has happened is Germany has let their contracts lapse, but Elsevier has continued to provide service. They haven't cut the service off, so basically Germany is not paying and Elsevier still is giving them some co uh, coverage. The universities have estimated they are saving roughly 8.7 million pounds a year from not being cut off. Uh, a few have been cut off, but they seem to be coping well. Some of the reasons why it seems that Elsevier hasn't cut them off, is that they don't want to lose face. Elsevier is supposed to, has a reputation to uphold supporting research and science, and if you cut off an entire country from quite a lot of research, um, that might not look so good. Also, Germany has prepared for the loss of access with a robust interlibrary loan system, and Elsevier may fear that the system works and that other countries will follow. So other universities have taken a, a harder, harsher stance, and Austria, France, and Switzerland are also gearing up for negotiations. So this will be interesting to watch. Some um, suggest that UK would not be able to do this because universities don't tend to work together. They usually are in competition. So in Germany, they're all you know, following one, beating in the same drum, but not here. Moving, sorry, moving right along. Um, Elsevier versus ResearchGate. So, this is running theme here. Elsevier pops up quite a lot in this. Um, they are a big publisher. So everyone knows, I hope, if you don't, ResearchGate. ResearchGate is an academic social networking site that it was founded in 2008 and is located in Berlin. Things I did not know until today or yesterday. Um, it is also funded by Welcome Trust, Goldman Sachs, and Bill Gates personally as a place for people to share their research. However, the problem is, is that many researchers, unfortunately, post the wrong version of their paper on ResearchGate, and they are breaking copyright law. They've estimated that 7 million articles are illegally deposited on ResearchGate. So, in September 15th, 20, on September 15th, 2017, the International Association of Scientific, Technical, and Medical Publishers wrote on behalf of 140 publishers telling uh, ResearchGate that they wanted an automated system to stop copyrighted material from being posted. And they gave them one week to reply, which really makes me think of 
how World War One started. But anyway, <laughs> they gave them a very short time to reply. And basically, ResearchGate said no and came back to them saying, send us takedown notices and we'll take the stuff down, which is obviously not a long-term solution. So in response to this, American Chemical Society and Elsevier have sued ResearchGate to um, clarify their copyright responsibilities. ResearchGate has removed 1.7 million papers. However, if there's 7 million supposedly illegally deposited, this is just a chip in the armor. So that has that yet to be resolved. The lawsuit is ongoing. But in the meantime, Springer Nature, CUP, and I think it's Thing, 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 I don't know, I'm sorry how to pronounce it, have all made their separate agreement with ResearchGate. So although the site won't be able to stop copyrighted material from being uploaded, they will be able to better track when and where this material is shared, um, which will, they can provide to the publishers. So the publishers can see how their work is being shared. They will also improve their information to researchers about how and what they can share on their website. And they will promptly remove any material found, provide information to, and as I said, provide information to publishers. Uh, I will say that you should read the privacy laws or the copyright rules on ResearchGate because it usually says it's in the researcher's hand. So if the publisher gets really mad, it might be the researcher who's at fault and not ResearchGate. So it's important to always read the small print. Um, it should be also valid to note that Elsevier and ACS are not involved in this agreement. And finally, a blog post or article rather was um, posted recently about the academic knowledge production process. So top five publishers, big publishers in the world are basically responsible for 50% responsible for of journal articles which is why they can increase subscription costs so readily and easily and have caused a lot of problems for library budgets over the years. Elsevier now, instead of being just a content provider, is now calling itself, has relabeled itself, information analytics company. And what that means, since 2010, they have been actively investing in data, data analytic companies and their profits have been steadily increasing ever since. Now, what are the implications of this? Why should we care? Well, the authors of this paper have mapped out what the research life cycle or what they call the knowledge production um, process. And they split it into three, the research process, so research gathering, funding, data collection, analysis, and writing. The publishing process, submission, peer review, etc. And then the research evaluation process, which is the measuring your impact, academic network, and promotions. And basically, they have superimposed all of the companies that Elsevier has quietly or not so quietly been buying up and put it along this research life cycle. And as you can see, um, Elsevier has really sort of taken over the entire process and have companies, and they've done it a bit shadily because they haven't changed the names of anything. So recently they've just bought Bee Press. Bee Press is still called Bee Press. Whereas, science, let's say, digital science has been quite obvious and promotes its services. Elsevier has been quietly doing this. And why is this a problem? Well, there could be a large conflict of interest if a um, one company decides how you kind of collect your data and then what can be published and then how its impact is measured. It gets a little dodgy. There's also they also have um, for infrastructure that finds uh, funding, such as Plumex, Mendeley, and Cyval. But it also has a company that impacts on hiring, like expert lookup. So if one country can't get, um, uh, you know, one, sorry, researcher can't get funding, then he might hurt his chances of being promoted. It also means that uh, Elsevier is in control of sort of the methodology and process, and that smaller companies will not be able to uh, compete at all because they have so much availability, uh, information available to them. So it's just something to be aware of and to keep in mind. And with that happy note, that ends my uh, update. If you have any questions, you can always email us or call us and we'll hopefully answer. And if you have any questions now, I'd be happy to answer anything. You can type them in the chat box or 